Let's see. And I think everyone should get some type of recording notification. But um, Chase, we'll talk after this, but I'll, we'll make sure to get this out on, on social media long as that's long as long as that is OK, then we'll make sure to send the, the recording to uh, the registrant registrants that um, signed up and they weren't able to join us today. Great. All right. Well, um, I'll monitor the uh, the participant list and chase. I'll let people uh, come in, or I'll, I'll I'll make sure people get in as uh, as they uh, join us. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. If we have not met, my name is Mike Delaney. I serve as the senior director of business partnerships at the Nebraska Hospital Association. My primary focus is I help lead NHA services, which many of you know that is our preferred business partnership program uh, at the Nebraska Hospital Association. Uh, we're joined today uh, by a legacy preferred partner. Uh, Medical Solutions has been an incredible supporter of us and uh, has been a significant contrib contributor to workforce solutions all across Nebraska with many hospitals. Um, did want to provide a little context. <clears throat> um, Medical Solutions is a Nebraska-based company uh, headquartered out of Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, they are the workforce solutions partner of 26 NHA member hospitals in Nebraska. And I do want to highlight something important. Not only do they support us through non-dues revenue generation, uh, but they support our scholarship uh, foundation initiative. There, it was just uh, many of you maybe have seen this through NHA's publications, but because of Medical Solutions contribution, we were able to award 29 nurses looking to advance uh, in their career path, and we were able to give out $100,000 uh, to help support uh, clinicians of tomorrow or nurses looking to uh, further elevate. So something that's very special, something that we're uh, really grateful for Medical Solutions support on. So uh, in just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Chase Farmer, but just a couple housekeeping items. Um, if, if, you, um, if you could kindly mute yourselves, um, I know Chase is very easygoing. Uh, I'm sure he will uh, welcome anyone and everyone to unmute and ask questions throughout the, the conversation today. Um, I do want to call out if you're not comfortable uh, asking a question to the group, you're more than welcome to private message me, and I would uh, love nothing more to ask that question uh, on your behalf. So um, with that being said, uh, let's, go, uh, let's go ahead and turn it over. Uh, this is Chase Farmer, uh, Chief Commercial Officer with Medical Solutions. Chase, take it away, my friend. Mike, thank you very much. Um, as Mike said, Chase Farmer, Chief Commercial Officer with Medical Solutions. Uh, Medical Solutions is one of the largest workforce solution firms in the United States. Um, while today we have offices across the country, we have offices from ranging from California uh, to, to Florida. As Mike said, we are founded um, in Nebraska. I'm an Omaha native myself. Um, both my folks grew up in uh, central Nebraska, so uh, shout out to Boone County if anyone is, is calling from central Nebraska. Uh, I've been in the industry for uh, about 15 years, um, and I've spent the vast majority of that time working with hospitals or large health systems uh, around solution design. And that most commonly comes in the form of managed service programs, or MSP. Uh, but Medical Solutions serves hospitals in, in every state across the country in a variety of different ways um, and really excited to talk with everyone here today. Uh, as an organization, we spend a lot of time and resources, frankly, uh, working with some incredible organizations uh, across the country, both sharing and learning best practices. Um, and while many people might recognize medical solutions and our presence as a, a contingency labor supplier, oftentimes the discussions that we have with organizations today really start with a holistic approach uh, to, to overall staffing. Um, and, and those conversations are really focused on the health of both patients and the staff, um, focused on quality, and certainly maintaining a focus on economic responsibility. Uh, so today, I uh, want to talk a little bit more about considerations for planning and forecasting, uh, data-driven decision-making, and certainly then the benefits uh, of having a, a flexible workforce within the organization. 
I thought I'd start with just a, a little bit of, a, of an outlook. We've we've certainly been talking about the nursing shortage as an industry for a long time. I'm sure that everyone on the call today has seen some day, some data, some data around the idea of of where we are with the shortage and, and what that looks like. So I don't want to spend a ton of time on any sort of uh, you know doom and gloom uh, outlook. But I did think that uh, this was a, a very interesting um, perspective. What we're looking at here is some stats from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And what I thought was really great about this was one, you can see you know, a little bit of optimism in, in the idea that registered nurses, if you look over the projection of what is look to the, the look to uh, the outlook of growth, is registered nurses are sitting at about 6% outlook from 2022 to 2032. So about double that of, of all total occupations outside of a diagnostic or, or treating practitioners. So certainly some optimism there. I, I think what's really interesting about the, the, the data here is, is actually the projecting timeline. And so the timeline outlines the idea of 22 to 2032. And why I think that's really important is the idea of where we are going with baby boomers. So by the year 2030, we know that all boomers will have turned 65 years of age. And of course, the obvious implications of Medicare on uh, an individual's 65th birthday. And we're looking at a projection of about 73 million boomers being 65 years or older by the year 2030. And so even with the, the optimism of the idea that registered nurses is a uh, uh, occupation is set to grow, I think the real challenge and the real question is, is just how much care are we talking about that's going to be needed bedside when we start getting in, into the next few years where the number of boomers is 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 reaching and exceeding 70 million? I think I read a statistic that I thought was pretty interesting was the idea of what that looks like from a daily uh, value. And so it's something like 10,000, 10,000 Americans every single day uh, of every week of every month of every year between now and 2030 will turn 65 every single day. It's pretty incredible. Um, so when we look at this, we can see obviously on the left hand side is what we see is sort of what that run looks like, right? We're, we're looking at the, the sort of the polarization or the separation between hospitalizations and our population. And you can see the outlook into the future from Medicare's perspective. And this, this chart goes pretty far. So I don't know that we have to necessarily spend too much time there. But I do think that one thing that's really interesting that we, we don't seem to spend as much time on as an industry as I think that is, is important, which is the increased competition, not only from hospital to hospital, but as an employer of choice, um, today in 2024 is, is a pivotal time in that in no other time in history has such a high percentage of nurses actually worked outside of a hospital setting. And so as we look at 2024, that percentage has now reached a point of 40%. So four out of 10 nurses, registered nurses, are not working in a hospital setting. And that shift is really important because it's not just the idea of how we traditionally think of nurses either bedside um, or, or in an acute setting or even in a post-acute setting. Nurses today are pushing into private sector positions uh, at, a, at an increasing rate. And so here's just a little bit of that look. Here's this kind of shift away from hospital-based employment. And so I'll first draw your eyes to the right-hand side where we can see where nurses are leaving. And so you can see on the far right hand side is nursing care facilities is the largest, but then you can start to see things like insurance companies, uh, uh, offices, department of events, and then hospitals. And so while hospitals is the smallest incremental there, it is that we are shifting away from hospital based and moving towards these uh, this other side. So things like outpatient care, employment agencies, and, and physician offices uh, kind of push to the highest, even elementary and secondary schools. And Medical Solutions does a lot of surveying of nurses. What are you doing today? What are you looking for tomorrow? What is driving you and these types of things? And I think that the correlation between the surveys on what people are looking for and the information that we are seeing on this slide today, it's, it's, it, it really shows you just how focused people are on things like wanting more day shifts, 
wanting less weekends and wanting to be off on holidays to spend time with their family. And so when we when we look at this, it's it's really kind of this shift now, a generational shift, which we most certainly will be talking about extensively here today. Uh, and, and and also then is a shift to the sort of gig work mentality. And I would just offer is that within our HR and talent acquisition teams, if we're not talking about sort of gig centric work benefits, we absolutely should be. Just wanted to kind of highlight sort of the realities of Nebraska. Certainly this is a national, it's even a global issue, but just as we look right here at home for, for all of us, um, just some of the stats around this. One of the things that we will certainly talk about is the retention of um, new grads today. And we can see it right there is that within critical access hospitals within Nebraska, uh, the percentage of people with less than one year of experience that have left their position. So it's certainly a, a, a real, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a real issue, a real concern is that as um, the older generation of tenured nurses are leaving, we're not just exchanging them one for one with a headcount of a younger nurse. We also are obviously seeing an extensive knowledge gap between someone that's leaving bedside with 25 years and coming in with one year. But now we're adding in another layer of complexity when we look at the idea that these new nurses that are coming in hit one year, hit two years, and the vast majority of them are leaving bedside. If not in the first year, most certainly in the second year, the percentage continues to increase to, I think, nearly 70% uh, within two years. Okay, so I know we're uh, somewhere between your first cup of coffee and, and, and lunch. Uh, so I was hoping to, you know, be able to keep people engaged and, and I thought if people would be willing to maybe throw something into the chat. Um, what I was was wanted to start with is sort of the common challenges uh, that we face with within staffing. And so I've got three options here. If people are willing, if you if you're if you're up at your keyboard, uh, throw in a one, a two or a three. Um, would love to see what relates most to your organization. Uh, is that a shortage of qualified clinicians? Is that high turnover rates? Or is it the idea that the challenge is, is mostly related to cost associated to staffing? Would, would, would love if, if people would throw in a one, a two, or a three into the chat. And as people are starting to do that, Mike, if, if you'll take a look at that, if you start to see numbers, I'll move on and, and kind of give us a little bit of uh, of optimism here related to the to the topic. So there are certainly signs um, for, for us to be optimistic about uh, year over year um, net patient revenues have been on the increase coming out of the pandemic. So we're at about an 8% uh, increase year over year, and we have started to see a, a, a relatively a significant decrease in our labor expenses. Um, when it comes to operating margin, we're, we're certainly on the path back. Um, you know, most organizations would probably be looking for a number that's, you know, at two or above two. Um, but when you compare that to where we got into during the sort of the height of the pandemic, most uh, organizations across the country were operating uh, in the red as far as operating margin. And so we have certainly seen an increase in, in, in sort of a recovery or a path to recovery when it comes to operating margin. And the same too then for vacancy rates. Although we are still, um, you know, uh, higher than we were sort of as we entered the pandemic, um, there is recovery that is happening since 22, 23, and, and vacancy rates are, are starting to decrease. Mike, do you have a, a consensus? What, what are your thoughts on our, on our questions here? Yeah, so looking through the chat, um, I think it, I think everyone, uh, we have an equal number of individuals at each number. Okay, so I'm not sure if that's ever, not sure if that's happened in these presentations with other uh, associations, but that's no, that's I'm yeah, that's great, that's great. I it, it really, you know, that's we see these as the three most common. So the idea that there's a, a level of consistency that we're seeing kind of across all three is 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 certainly not surprising. Um, considerations for addressing turnover. So I, I kind of mentioned it before, right? Medical Solutions um, has has been in the industry for, for over 20 years. You know, we have placed tens of thousands of, of nurses across the United States in that time. 
Um, and, you know, one of the things that we do to try and stay on top of understanding what our uh, clinicians are thinking and to be able to provide feedback and understanding to our client hospitals is Medical Solutions surveys these clinicians uh, quite often. Um, we have done thousands of surveys trying to better understand what clinicians' point of view is on the market, on how they worked with a particular customer, what their um, interests are, uh, and what the drivers are for them as they consider their their next stage of employment to to be a traveler, to to kind of hang up the you know, the traveling credentials and settle back down into a, a perm position back home or, or to move across the country to to a new location to, to take a perm job. And over the course of, of those 20 years, I think it's it's probably going to be kind of like a of course moment for, for everyone is pay has always been at the top of the list of drivers for for cl clinicians on either why they take a position or, or why they leave a position. Interestingly enough, is over the last 18 to 24 months, we've seen a pretty significant shift in what those considerations are. And while low pay or pay in general continues to be a top three consideration, it's dropped from number one to number three. And in that same period of time, uh, personal factors, um, primarily mental health, has has risen from being sometimes within the top 10 but sometimes outside of the top 10 to being in the top three and so burnout associated to mental health um and and the driver associated then to turnover and what that has looked like just in the last year and a half i would say is that you know from medical solutions point of view is we think it's a pretty drastic change uh, to see personal health factors rise up the list at, at such the speed that they have over the course of the last year, year and a half. And I think the importance of that is the idea that as we, you know, as organizations continue to look at turnover and say to ourselves, you know, how do we address and, and approach turnover? I think too often in conversations that we have with organizations, it immediately jumps to what, what we cannot afford to pay nurses, what they're suggesting that they want to be paid. And, and certainly pay is going to continue to be a, a primary factor. I, I, would, I would never suggest it's not. I would say is that some of the organizations who have really kind of flipped the script and changed their focus and their priority to um, really understanding and supporting the mental health uh, of their nurses have have had the best success with addressing turnover. And of course, from a, a turnover perspective, you you know you really can't have that conversation without talking about the associated cost of of turnover, and the financial impact. Um, you know, interestingly, is it, you see here is every percent change uh, in nurse turnover, whether we whether the nurse turn, turnover increases by a percent or it decreases by a percent. For for every percent, we're talking about you know over a quarter of a million dollars annually in cost associated to that, and turnover continues to have heightened cost. So we have seen an average increase just in the last year of about seven and a half percent of of cost associated to every single turnover of 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 a, of a nurse bedside. And so when we talk when we talk about you know the considerations, uh, we talk about prioritizing that and what is the strategy you know that we're going to to implement in order to retain more of these nurses. That conversation inevitably will always lead towards workforce planning, which is which is really the, at the heart of what we want to to talk about today. Okay, so. You know, workforce planning, you know, the goal of workforce planning uh, should should certainly be the, you know, finding and, and, and building a more sustainable approach uh, to to staffing. I think the reality is, is that there, there's no magic pill here within within workforce planning, unfortunately, but but rather there is an incredible opportunity for incremental improvement. And so whenever we sit down with organizations, large or small, we we really dive into workforce planning. We kind of follow these 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 four steps and that's to assess, develop, identify and forecast. 
Uh, and for the purpose of today's conversation, I really just want to lean into uh, these first two, uh, assessing your current workforce and then identifying talent and skill gap. So let's start with assessing. Uh, I think the real value opportunity is identifying inefficiencies, um, you know, improving resource allocation, reducing turnover, uh, and of course, em enhancing employee satisfaction. Um, and we'll talk more about the importance of leveraging data analytics, uh, but it certainly implies uh, applies here today with 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 the assessing your workforce, um, informing staffing decisions or or balancing quality and cost, uh, supporting the strategic planning for an organization. Um, one that I would call out just because it has been. Um, it's been a conversation that is coming up in national conferences, especially with CNOs, and that is associated to a workload. Um, and, and more specifically is the span of control of our management team. When we talk about burnout and turnover, um, talk about the difficulties of not only bringing in top talent, but retaining that talent, we oftentimes are leaning on the, the leadership, the mid-level leadership that is on the floors or running the departments. And there's been an incredible amount of turnover. Um, coming through the pandemic, we were starting to really lose some of these highly experienced nurse leaders, 10, 15, 20 years of leadership experience. And instead, as you see the average number of years of leadership experience across department managers has now dropped below five years. And we have put these new managers in a position from a workload, uh, from a span of control um, that is oftentimes exceeding 100. And when we put that kind of a workload on the mid-level leadership, on the floor leadership or department leadership, we're creating burnout within that group. And so then what we find is that as we are moving forward, uh, in through 2024 is average uh, number of years experience for a manager has is continues to drop down. Um, and we're we're now we're now considerably under the five year mark because we're losing this sort of second round of managers because we're not putting them in a position to succeed. And the span of control is at such a level that we're burning them out or not giving them the opportunity to really focus on supporting the staff on on their department or on their team. Secondly, identifying talent and, and skill gap. I think we often time uh, times talk about the gap. We just refer to it as a headcount gap, right? We've lost two staff. We need to bring in two staff. Uh, but in the reality, I think the skill gap um, is become even more critical in many ways because of the loss of such tenured nurses, right? We, we lose a 25 year nurse and we replace them with a two year nurse. So the knowledge gap, uh, certainly goes way beyond just staffing ratios or or headcount. Um, and whether we're kind of, you know, assessing current workforce or identifying that gap, I think it really comes down to starting with the with the right questions. Uh, and, and that's an essential piece of of, of where we start. Uh, so, you know, capacity analysis, right? Things like average age of nursing workforce, um, who's next to retire. Um, we start getting into delayed retirement programs. So some of the organizations that we are working with are trying to, um, to delay that gap by holding on to those more tenured nurses at, in a capacity that they can. So you start talking about not just skill gap identification, but you're really talking about flexibility or, or allocation of resources. The two primary ways that we are seeing that happen is through virtual nursing programs and mentorship programs. So as nurses are getting closer to retirement age, um, frankly, the idea of, you know, working 36 or 48 hours on their feet, 12 hour days, I think oftentimes our, our tenured nurses, um, their, their bodies are, are frankly giving up sooner than their minds or certainly their hearts. And so a lot of organization, organizations are starting to build out these virtual nursing programs 
uh, where the idea is, is that these more tenured nurses are being able to uh, delay retirement by supporting the younger floor nurses um, with some sort of a virtual capacity where they are now spending their time at a desk uh, and supporting those nurses via a camera systems, phone systems, um, and then tying that to a mentorship program. One of the big areas of concern that we have when we're talking about this transition from a generational divide is the idea of kind of finding some um, commonality between the nurses that are exiting workforce and nurses that are coming in. And there's so much knowledge to be gained by those nurses who have that 25 plus years of experience and creating opportunity for them to uh, form mentors, uh, mentorships with these younger nurses, not only to help to reduce that skill gap, but as we had talked about before, is to create an environment of, of buy-in and confidence in these younger nurses where we can start to alter this idea of just how many nurses, uh, new, new grad nurses or, or new nurses coming in are leaving bedside care within the first two years. That's that's probably one of the things that we need to as as an industry um, or even as a partner medical solutions to help organizations address is we're, we're never going to sh to tighten up the skill gap and we're never going to gain the head count with the appropriate skill set is if we're losing 70% of nurses within the first two years of their employment. They make up the vast majority um, um, of of tenure lost is is new is new nurses coming in. I wanted to be able to leave everyone with a few questions to think about. Obviously, every organization that's being represented here today have their own differences and sort of this, you know, this this one sided approach webinar isn't going to be able to, to help each of you in that moment. So we wanted to be able to leave you with at least a starting point when we're talking about that workforce planning and the questions that we should be asking ourselves. Um, and so I've listed those here and I just wanted to go through those quick. It's the idea of how do we as an organization identify and prioritize uh, the most essential talent segments within within our hospital, within our organizations? Can we leverage adjacent internal skill sets? You know, so what what does that look like um, as we are planning for the type of care or the type of positions that will need to be filled tomorrow? What do we know about that today and how can we leverage that skill set? Which roles and or skills should we be prioritizing the development of? Um, it's it's interesting to see is you almost see these waves. You know, there's there's kind of the expression of like it always comes. Things always come in threes um, is we oftentimes see similar representation in organizations where they'll go through a particular department will sort of have a series of events, right? Two nurses out on maternity leave or three nurses retiring and really starting to identify and understand where do we need to prioritize the development of skill set uh, and what roles will need to be filled. We start to transition from being reactionary to being prescriptive. And that's where data really starts to come in, and we'll talk about that more. But the idea of having the 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 data to to make sound decisions and to defend why we're making those decisions on where we are going, is is probably one of the single biggest impacts to that transition of reactionary to prescriptive. And then lastly, how do we retain essential talent and support the growth in a competitive labor market? We've talked about it a couple of times, but the, the loss of, of our existing talent will offset any ability to have any kind of success with recruiting new. And so we really have to think of it in, in a twofold strategy. How do we how do we compete in this type of a market to to you know win uh, the talent to come in? And then, of course, is how do how do we retain that talent once we have them? Another question. So we're 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 a little more than halfway through. I wanted to to have another pause here and and to um, uh, ask another question for people, if you would mind, is is putting in a one, two, or a three, um, and and that's the idea of what are the typical roadblocks as your organization has has looked at workforce planning or as you've tried to take that on um, and the three options that we have here are a lack of real-time actionable analytics 
uh, retention of new hires and existing staff, or then a pipeline generation for, for new hires. If people are, are willing to put in a one, two, or a three, and then Mike, if you'll if you'll help with that. So for those of you thinking one, um, you know, real time analytics, I, I would say that you're not alone. Um, this is coming from the HMA. Uh, it's the Health Management uh, Academy, and this is a survey of respondents on their top uh, challenges. This is for CHROs and, and CNOs, and we can see at the top of the list is, you know, no surprise, um, you know, cost of staff along with with tech and supplies. Um, but as a follow up to that, um, when you look at the most important factor, when an organization is choosing a partner to help them with workforce solutioning, uh, real time and actionable data falls to the top of the list. Mike, are we seeing ones? Or are we seeing more twos or threes? Mm. Well, it looks like we do have representation from, from all those challenges, uh, okay. but we have a tie for number one and number two. Perfect. OK, well, so there we go. Number one, real time actionable data, mo most most definitely um, a, a leading indicator from from some of the surveys that we are seeing coming out of the industry. When it comes to, you know, retention, um, nurses, along with allied professionals, uh, not surprisingly, are are at the top of that list. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that it's it, it's a it's the same sort of indicator that we talked about before when we start looking at that turnover uh turnover has uh come down slightly over the course of the last 18 to 24 months but we're we're still pushing you know turnover rates in some organizations that are exceeding 20 percent um and and as stated before one of the things that we really need to get our hands around is the idea that uh within uh, nurses that are within their first two years are, are making up about 70 percent um of, of that turnover so engaging with younger generations um we've we've been working with a number of organizations and and interestingly enough have had quite a bit of success with sort of going back to older playbooks. This certainly isn't new, um, but you, you, you sort of see that kind of runs in cycle uh, um, of, of where we're able to see success. Um, and I would say is that coming out of new grad outreach programs, both high school and college level, high school has been a, a, a particularly interesting in the idea that we've been working with some organizations where they're bringing in high school grads with relatively you know, low skill set, low level positions, but then bringing them sort of into the hospital's ecosystem. And as those um, employees gain more experience, then pulling them into uh, you know, things like CNA programs or LPN programs or then nursing programs and starting to see quite a bit of success. I've highlighted the last two uh, because I would say that these are the areas where Medical Solutions has really started to see a, a, a pretty incredible uptick in where we are starting to consult with organizations. And it's also something that did not exist just a few years ago. So the first one I have here is is maintaining a social media presence. Um, and for any of you that have um, been around as, as long as I have, I can understand the idea there might be a little bit of kind of an eyebrow raise or, or possibly even an eye roll. Uh, the idea of the value of things like social media presence. I, I will tell you as an organization that puts an absolute ton of resources from a marketing perspective into social media presence, um, this cannot go uh, ignored. Organizations, even hospital organizations, need to reprioritize the way that they are connecting with potential employees. And the reality is, is as we make this generational shift to the next generation, this is how they work. It is via their phone. It is via social media platform. Um, it is give me the information quick um, and let me make my decision from there. Um, where medical solutions has put, um, you know, its emphasis around that, you know, we onboard a few thousand nurses uh, who apply to medical solutions or one of our uh, sister companies, a few thousand per week. 
So when you're talking about onboarding and, and building an application process and, and building an engagement strategy with young uh, people that are looking to join the workforce, um, you know, Medical Solutions puts more emphasis on on things like social media than we do any of the traditional outlets. Job fairs or, and, and these types of things uh, are, have really gotten to a point where they're they're just being outworked by the idea of social media platforms and, and social media presence. So I would highly encourage is whether we have um, you know HR folks on on the line, department leaders on the line. We should be having conversations with our marketing department about what our social media presence looks like. And then feeding into that would be um, the amount of work that we have put into uh, hospitals improving their websites for engagement and for efficient application process or access for, for new hires. So if, if any of you, it's probably been a minute, but if any of you have looked at the application process for your organization, think of it from um, a prospective employee's um, point of view and access your own website and then look for where is it that I'm going to see that there's opportunity for a job and, and click on that and then kind of follow the process through. How cumbersome is it? Is it difficult to find? Are you having to spend 10 or 15 minutes um, filling out information like your name and what position you're interested in and some of these just general application processes? And I will, I will, I will offer is that if you run through that process, compare it to the idea that an organization like Medical Solutions that puts tons of study, research, time, and, 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 and frankly money into creating the best possible experience for applicants to come in and apply to medical solutions, reducing that time so that they can go from clicking on our website to an application being sent to a recruiter calling them about their interest in a matter of minutes total. So an application process that can happen within seconds. And that is, you know, I had previously talked about the idea that we're in a competitive landscape where organizations are not just competing with a hospital in the next town or down the street. We're now com com competing across industry. And the idea that you, that an organization that is, that's trying to sort of foster a relationship with a prospective employee has, um, um, you know, a website that might be outdated, that's cumbersome to access, the application process is drawn out, it doesn't feel like five or 10 minutes is a long time, but when you're competing against, an, you know, organizations that have put energy into that and, and can process an application that much quicker, you would most definitely be surprised, especially with the younger generation, um, is that they, they, they don't have five or 10 minutes. At least they don't want to give up five or 10 minutes. And if they can't apply to that or, or be pulled into an application process within seconds, um, you are likely losing applicants who are ready to work, qualified to work, interested to work, and you're simply losing them through, through an application process. So switching gears now to, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, is, is the idea of um, data-driven decision-making. And we we talked about analytics in the, the last question, um, but this is probably the hottest topic that's happening in the industry. And so as an organization, if we're not talking about data-driven decision-making, if we're not talking about machine learning, if we're not talking about AI and the implications of AI, I can tell you that that the vast majority of the, of the industry is. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. I can tell you that, um, you know, in that time, if you look back, say, 10 years, medical solutions or even five years, medical solutions did not have a single data scientist on staff. But today we have dozens of, of, of data scientists. Um, and, you know, that, that data backed decision making can obviously help us with unnecessary spending. It can help with reducing turnover by reviewing the data that's coming in. Um, and, and we're seeing some really significant applications. Some of the most most important application, in, in, in my opinion, is the idea of how we are getting prescriptive around demand and how we are getting um, more uh, intentional and accurate around pay. 
And so here's just an, an, an example. Um, this is the application of that technology. It's just the tip of the iceberg. But here's our, a couple of screenshots coming out of medical solutions on those two fronts. So everyone has heard of the uh, idea, whether you've used it or not, is, is what Uber has done to the transportation world. Um, Uber uses an element of Uber when it comes to uh, demand and pricing that they use is referred to as dynamic pricing. And that's the idea that if you've ever used Uber to go from one location to another at a certain time of day, um, you'll get one price. And you take that same exact trip, but this time you take it on a Friday night where it's much busier, the demand is much higher, and that price changes. So what Medical Solutions is doing with data scientists and machine learning is we are starting to take the, the data that we are inputting from, from our relationships with thousands of hospitals, tens of thousands of clinics, uh, both in the acute and the post-acute setting. We work with schools and some other private sector uh, organizations to help them with staffing as well. And you really start to understand the dynamics that go into a a particular geography related to to the demand. And with that information, we can now start to model and forecast what demand will look like. Um, you know, ultimately, I think what we want to do is to be able to build um, you know, um, a machine learning model, which can get us prescriptive with weeks in advance. Now that kind of work takes time, it takes a lot of input. Um, but it's been it's been incredible to see as we work with clients and understand their information, not only on their utilization, but even socioeconomic uh, demographic information within that region uh, to see what we can do as far as forecasting for their demand. Um, and then pricing is sort of the same thing, kind of described that with the with the Uber example. But the idea of knowing what supply is and what demand is within a given area we can start getting very prescriptive on pricing. And so instead of the idea of trying to negotiate a price months or even years in advance of a, of a need, right? So you sign a contract with an organization, weeks, months, or years later, you have a need. Where does that rate stand within market? Are you paying too much? And there was opportunity for you to save. Are you offering too little? And then now positions aren't being filled. This is the one example or two examples, I suppose, where Medical Solutions is using that um, technology to serve um, how, how we serve customers. But uh, lots of organizations are starting to bring these this in-house, starting to use machine learning and data uh, analytics uh, and AI in-house in, in so that they can get more prescriptive on what they're trying to do with, the, with their own staff. Some of the considerations, um, if you're if you're looking into data driven decision making, if you're looking into how your organization can get better at at, at um, getting more prescriptive and less sort of reactionary, the three considerations that I would leave you with are are, are these. First is accuracy and quality of the data. Um, we often say is good data in, good data out. Bad data in, bad data out. Um, the integration of diverse data sources. So we always want to think of it from a variety of sources. We should have operational sources, financial sources, and employee metrics or feedback. And by layering those across, we can gain the most comprehensive view of the organization. Um, and that, com you know, that that in combining that data uh, is what pr provides us with the best, um, or 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 you know, helps us to understand trends and issues with a, a more holistic uh, view. And then lastly is regular review and and certainly adapting um, once we learn and, and, and see that. I think that kind of goes um, without saying or, or makes sense just in, in the in the title. But obviously we want to continuously review and, and adapt sort of how we are collecting or how we are interpreting um, that data. And that is sort of in, in a, that sort of an, an evolution across the organization um, and and leads to improved results. Uh, from what that data is 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 saying, um, or or what the interpretations mean. Lastly, wanted to talk about flexible workforce uh, and, and and channels. I would say coming out of the pandemic is that building out multiple channels of care has really become an essential part of of staffing strategies. Um, 
you know, the idea of are you relying, you know, too much on perm staff and in, in, in doing so you're really lacking flexibility? Are you relying too much on contingent labor and contract labor and therefore, you know, it's too, too expensive? Um, the idea of trying to create multiple channels for organizations where medical solutions is helping organizations from their contingent staff, whether that's using travelers or per diem or local contracts, um, whether we're offering perm placements, whether that's international or local perm placements, or then if we're working with an organization to help them uh, to develop internal travel programs or float pool programs for themselves, or working with organizations because they want to develop a job sharing or a rotating shifts program. Um, building out that, that flexibility and having the most number of channels to provide that flexibility, maximize cost savings, um, has been a real value coming out of the pandemic and, and where organizations are really starting to trend. So last question for us, if, if people are willing to, again, throw in a, a one, two, or a three, um, flexible workforce sort of channels, um, would love to hear what you have implemented or tried within your organization. So if you'll give me a one for utilizing sort of traditional um, contingent approach, whether that's travelers or per diem, local contractors, um, are, are organizations uh, offering rotating shifts or, or creating job sharing programs? And then three, anyone developing an internal travel or some people just say would say is an internal float program. Um, would love to hear how people are viewing their own flexible channels. And while Mike pulls that information, obviously would just, you know, kind of share is, you know, what that value looks like, right? We're trying to improve our, our workforce retention by creating those opportunities. We've seen a number of organizations who develop a program to retain nurses who were looking to leave permanent, permanent position in order to pursue a travel program uh, with a traditional travel agency um, have created that sort of float pool, created uh, more flexible work options for their own staff in order to retain them. Uh, obviously, in everything we want to do, we want to, you know, enhance patient care. And as we improve the channels of care, I think that we are improving then is the talent that we are bringing into an organization and, and obviously having a direct impact on patient care. Um, you know, recruitment appeal, opt optimizing resource utilization, obviously all important values uh, associated with, with those channels. Mike, how, how are we looking? Same thing? Are we seeing a, a spread? <clears throat> uh, this one's less of a spread. Uh, okay. We have a lot of votes uh, in the one and two category. There was a mention that there uh, there's an, indiv uh, an individual organization that may be considering uh, number three in the, de in, in the development of an internal travel program. But one right. the ones and twos have it okay have ones and twos okay well th let's look at this then the, the 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 last thing that i wanted to offer when it when it comes to the um the the sort of flexibility of the workforce channels is just what considerations as an organization we we should be thinking about um especially when you look at you know the 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 one organization or the one individual that said they're they're looking at maybe building out those those flow pools you know, you certainly want to have either a sound understanding of the regulatory compliance or having a partner um, that that understands that. I would say that regulatory regulatory compliance is, is is probably one of the largest factors that it that keeps organizations sidelined when it comes to building out their own uh, pool structures. Um, especially for organizations, it may not be the case for, for anyone on th this call today, but especially for the case is organizations or hospitals that are tied to systems where you're crossing state lines um, and starting to get into per diems, daily allowances, stipends, and some of those conversations. So certainly consider, you know, one of the primary considerations uh, is just making sure that we understand those regulations labor laws uh, and avoiding any, you know, obviously costly legal issues uh, around compliance. Staffing coordination, um, oftentimes, whether it's, you know, one, two or three um, organizations that are attempting to do this on a whiteboard in the staffing office, um, uh, which we see we see quite a bit, um, you know, trying to take on the coordination of 
of these different systems without having a dedicated technology um, is probably one of the considerations. And there's there's so many options uh, out in 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 the world from a, from a technology perspective. Certainly, companies like Medical Solutions offer technology like that, but but um, not here to just promote Medical Solutions. Wanting to provide the information for you guys to make the best choice and decision for your organizations, I would say is that trying to take on um you know building out one of those channels or one of those approaches without the technology to support it is 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 certainly a key consideration when it comes to uh, the coordination of those programs or of that staff um, employee engagement and, and communication um you know as we build these programs out oftentimes what we see is that the staff don't have enough information or clear communication on what's happening and, and where as an organization we're going or what our goals and what we're trying to achieve within those decisions is so implementing you know clear communication strategies uh, and and support systems right uh, to keep those um, staff that keep those workers engaged and informed um, obviously, we want to, you know, foster an environment of sort of, you know, inclusion and, and commitment to them as we try to, uh, you know, keep retaining the staff that that we have. And then lastly, cost management. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think a lot of what Medical Solutions sees from a consulting standpoint is just an evaluation of the financial impact related to flexible workforce um, arrangements. Um, and, and oftentimes what we find is that the goal coming out of it might have been to, say, reduce the cost of, of, of travel uh, contracts or reduce the cost of premium and overtime pay. And oftentimes is there is not an extensive evaluation of the true cost of the solution that's being presented. And so we have worked with a number of organizations that have, for instance, stood up their own pool um, and come to find out is that when you start really adding up the cost associated to that, they were spending more on the pool cost per hour for their own perm staff than they were on contingent labor or then vice versa where Medical Solutions comes in and consults with an organization um, who unfortunately was in a partnership where the associated cost was was just too too high. You know, I, I think by and large, longer the day, long gone are the days of premium pay associated to things like overtime cost when it comes to working with agencies. Um, we really we really shouldn't be paying um, certainly above a one and a half times multiplier. But in most cases, we really should be looking for opportunities that over time isn't even costing us a, a one and a half time multiplier. Um, and, and so that cost management or evaluation of the cost associated to the different channels that we are testing is making sure that we are putting kind of concrete math and review and analysis next to those channels to make sure that we are actually achieving the thing that we want to achieve. And if cost savings isn't at the front of of that and and rather it's the idea of retaining staff there might be cost associated to retaining staff that we find as valuable right to offset the idea of what it cost uh, to bring in new staff but regardless of sort of which of those approaches or, or really any of the elements of workforce planning i think oftentimes when we meet with organizations uh, organizations will start to start on the front end of the conversation and what what I will often try to do is to get them to instead is let's jump to the let's jump to the end. Let's jump to the goals, right? Let's jump to what we're trying to achieve and sort of start there and understand what is the the what is the sort of strategic initiative? What is the objective of the strategic initiatives that the organization is trying uh, to obtain? And then let's then work backwards and build a plan to achieve those things. And and obviously, in most cases, that cost management is, is going to be a, an important part. I'll close out here with, you know, just the idea of some of the, the key considerations, um, you know, the considerations for planning for forecasting for 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 your workforce needs. Um, we talked a lot about data driven decision making and and what value that can create for an organization. And then lastly, we talked about the idea of of implementing uh, flexible work channels. Um, you know, it's a it's a series of 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 steps. I think I said it before. It's probably no single magic pill, but but rather the idea of looking for uh, incremental improvement and incremental change. 
Um, would love to turn it over to see if there are questions that have come through, Mike, or if anyone wants to to, to put anything out directly. Uh, you know, Medical Solutions certainly has the ability to to help organizations to better understand where they stand today um, and, and where they're trying to go tomorrow. If that's something that we could ever help with, we certainly would love the opportunity to talk with you in a, in a more personal setting. Um, but if there's any questions I can address for the for the broader group, uh, please let me know. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> Chase, let me first start by saying thank you. Uh, this was some insightful information and, and, and a lot of moving pieces here. Um, I did have one question, pretty common question with webinars. Um, are you comfortable sending these slides to the uh, registrants of this webinar? Absolutely. Most definitely. I'll get that to you, Mike, and you can help us out with that, the, the distribution. Most definitely. Yeah, it would be <clears throat> would be more than happy to. Of course, you're 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 welcome. Questions for for Chase, uh, an opportunity to to ask uh, anything that's that's on your mind. Um, if not, I do have a, a couple questions that uh, I, I kind of thought about as we were as Chase as you were going through that conversation. Um, Please, you know, I'll, I'll just I'll just dive in. You know, thinking about the 92 member hospitals that we serve. Uh, at the Nebraska Hospital Association, 62 of those are, are critical access. They're the rural critical access hospitals. I know there was mention of, you know, internal float pools. Um, what advice, Chase, would you give to those rural, the, the smaller organizations that maybe don't have quite the bandwidth that uh, that others might? Yeah. So, you know, so there's certainly going to be a difference um, from from a critical access hospital in a remote location in Nebraska, you know, compared to, a, a, you know, a, a large, um, you know, teaching facility in, in Atlanta with with uh, 1100 beds. Right. So sure. certainly, certainly understand that. I would still say is that there there is always an opportunity to put a, a spin that is appropriate for the size organization or the location of the of the organization. So oftentimes with smaller organizations is start with the greatest need. So if we're in a critical access, um, you know, what is the skill set that we have the the most number of FTEs associated to? What is the shifts or um, you know day of the week or whatever we're trying to to address from a demand perspective? And then get creative with, um, you know, the flexibility of of schedules, um, the idea of of sort of creating opportunity for um, the the nurses involved in in, in that small hospital to um, build a non conventional work schedule um, is probably where I would where I would start really understanding what that group of nurses is one of the benefits of, of that of that small team then is you should really be able to have a meeting that really allows all voices to be to be heard um and i think that that's one of the one of the sort of significant changes that we've seen is sort of an approach of involving the staff younger nurses today are are less interested in you know how many hours can i work and how much pay can can be created and instead, they've they have they prioritize the idea of autonomy. Um, they prioritize the uh, the ideals of flexibility, and they prioritize the importance of how their voice is considered in where decision making goes. And so, I think that that's probably where I would start. Um, certainly, not to say is that the, you know the organization in in remote locations. Um, are, are probably more likely going to have to rely on some of the other channels that we talked about, the idea of contingent labor being brought into that market. And then what we need to do is focus on keeping the nurses there. You know, if we bring someone into a to a to a remote location, let's identify the type of nurse that might consider taking that 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 contract and transitioning into a position of permacy with with that organization. Um, and, and that's, again, why I think it's so important is that we focus on a multitude of channels uh, because the critical access is, is, is certainly going to have more difficulty with a float pool as a primary solution than, than a larger organization. Um, looks like, Chase, we have just about a minute left. Um, okay. Other questions from, from the group? Give it just about 
30 seconds as we all embrace silence. But I uh, want to make sure we we capture any questions that come through. All right, Chase, I'm not seeing anything else. Um, please know that um, if there's other questions that that come to fruition or come to mind, uh, please feel free to reach out to us at, at the Nebraska Hospital Association. I'm happy to streamline a conversation uh, with Chase or anyone with the Medical Solutions team. Um, very easy going group as well. You're more than welcome to reach out to them directly and just reference this uh, this webinar and this, and this dialogue today. So. With that, Chase, let's go ahead and conclude. Uh, sincerely, thank you. Um, this is this is very meaningful. I think some really um, really good information for uh, for our members to 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 consider. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and and everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.